a lot. I've been Nintendo's bitch for the past 13 years. The second my mum handed me a DS and a copy of Disney Friends, it was all over. My childhood was exclusively comprised of Mario vs Donkey Kong Mini Land Mayhem, Wii Sports Resort and Nintendogs Plus Cats Golden Retriever and Friends. In other words, I was bullied in high school. Just look at all this shit. I could have played football or been really into art or something. Hell, even chess would have been better than unironically owning a Wii U. I also played chess in high school. But I'm a changed man now. I'm no longer Nintendo's piggy bank. If I see a 3D World port on sale for £50, I won't buy it. Now, £35? Come on, man, that's a steal. I'd be an idiot not to buy that. I'm not a Nintendo fan, I swear. You know what? I'll prove it. I'll write a script and record some narration and film myself on a green screen and download the Animal Crossing soundtrack and edit it all together and upload it to YouTube and... Wait, what was I talking about again? Nintendo fucking sucks, dude. You want to know why? Their games are mega lame, and their consoles are way underpowered, and their online service? Cringe. And their release strategy? Not great. And their complete disregard for their fan base, frequent takedowns of passion projects, flaunting of their own monopoly, and complete lack of effort beyond the bare minimum is completely opposed to what their brand image stands for. And why the hell do I like this company? Oh yeah, they made Wii Sports Resort. The year is 2002. I am a baby, and Xbox Live is born, and with it comes... A quarter of minutes, and I'll break your fucking legs, you little prick! Never gonna say! Playing games with other people from across the world while talking to them on your £200 Simpsons hit and run machine was kind of incredible for the time. I guess, again, I was about two weeks old when Xbox Live came out. And in the time since then, gaming has evolved. Now instead of calling people racial slurs in voice chat, you can call people racial slurs on your live stream. Achievements, profiles, direct messages, parties, clubs, forums, cloud safe, share play, cross play, a £50 a year price tag. All of these platforms have at the very least most of these things embedded right into them. Meanwhile, in the time between me being an infant and me being an infant pretending to be an adult, Nintendo's online service has gained a price tag. Nintendo Switch Online. I'll give it to them, they did a great job copying Microsoft's homework. For £20 a year, you get access to a whole load of fuck all. Voice chat in a smartphone app. Cloud saves that just don't work for the games you'd actually want a cloud save for. The ability to spend even more money on overpriced controllers. Access to a library of old games that no one cares about. And slightly less old games that you might care a little bit about. And Tetris 99, baby! Give it up for the worst Battle Royale game! But hey, at least the multiplayer works now. Right? Nintendo uses peer-to-peer -peer for most of their games. What does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Basically, it's a fancy way of saying that they couldn't be bothered to pay for any servers. Instead, Splatoon, Mario Kart, Animal Crossing, all of them use your console as a server, which is fine if you've got a decent connection. It actually works pretty well, until that one prick with a dial-up connection decides he wants to go. Server disconnects, frame dips, entire teams disconnecting, all commonplace and in every single Nintendo published online game. And I mean all of them. You'd think a company that is setting financial records left, right and centre would have the time to make sure their online service works, but nah, too hard. Buy our LAN adapter and stop complaining, bitch. Like for fuck's sake, even Clubhouse Games struggles to work. Board games! Nintendo messed up online multiplayer for board games! But this is an easy fix. Just swap out the peer-to-peer -peer system for a server-based one. Boom, problem solved. Right? It's pretty universally understood how online games are meant to work, right? You're meant to get into a game quickly, matches are meant to be balanced, and playing with friends is simple. Well, forget about all that shit. We're going back to the Stone Age on this bad boy. Splatoon 2. Why the hell do I have to sit through a two minute long cutscene every single time I start the game just to be told what maps are in rotation? What the fuck? Why is playing with friends a completely different option in the menu? Who designed this shit? Why is Salmon Run only available at certain times? 
Like, what point does this serve? Why do I have to walk around a hub area just to get to the game select menu? Why is ranked mode completely different to casual? Th that's not what ranked is meant to be, Nintendo. Why is team balancing completely non-existent? What the fuck does this level even mean? Does it do anything? Why is it even there? Why do I have to play two billion matches just to level up one level? Why is stats tied to clothing in a first person multiplayer shooter and it's the dumbest system I've ever seen? What the fuck is this shit? This is all in one game. Mario Kart, what is the point of the chat when the only things I can say are hello and I'm using tilt controls? Arms, why does it dump me into a lobby with 10 other people before randomly putting me in matches with a random number of people? What fucking mad lad came up with this? Animal Crossing, why do you have to go through the most backwards and convoluted process just to get someone to show up on your island? Why can't you just invite them? Smash Bros. I don't play Smash Bros, I just assume it's bad. Mario Party, why the hell can you only play mini games online? I stand corrected. Just, 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 what the fuck are they doing? Nintendo, please play an online game, and I don't mean one of your own. Learn how this shit works, so by the time the Switch 2 rolls around, I might actually be able to use your online service without suffering from a stroke. It's not hard, it's really not. Just let people make parties on the console itself, give out some free games, actually use servers, that one's important. Then you can charge all you want. 50 pound, 100 pound, a billion, I don't care. As long as I never have to see a friend code again, I'll be a happier man. But hey, even if they don't do all that, at least we got a brand new Switch Online benefit to get excited about. That's right, I'm talking about Pac-Man 99, baby. Give it up for this steaming pile of shit, ladies and gentlemen. Fucking hell. It was infamous back in the GameCube and DS era how much effort Nintendo put into making Little Timmy's DS Lite indestructible. These things just didn't break. You could practically have a bomb go off near one and it would still survive. See? Like, just look at my DS Lite. I dropped this so many times as a kid, my fingers must have been constantly covered in butter or something, I don't know. You'd think with a hinge and two screens, this thing would have shattered into like 50 pieces all at once, but... Nope. It's not perfect, there's nicks and scratches all over it, the top screen has a big clump of dead pixels, and the entire thing looks like it's lived in a puddle for the past 10 years, but it does play video games still, which is more than can be said for my PS2. Here's my 3DS, I dropped this even more than the original. There's a lot of delicate and intricate tech crammed in here. Three screens, an IR sensor, a circle pad, three cameras, and a hinge. So you'd think with this amount of missing paint, it would definitely be busted. Oh no, is it actually broken? It actually won't fucking turn on. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Then we get to the Switch. I've never dropped this and it's more broken than the others. Look at the fucking fan. One piece has already fallen off, two more are on the verge, the entire fan cover is cracked at the side. The number of times I've had a bug where the entire system goes black and I had to restart it is way too high to count. I've had to send these Joy-Cons to customer support twice because they're that poorly made. Once because of a desync issue that basically everyone had at launch, and the second was because both sets of SL and SR buttons just stopped working at the same time for no reason. And that's not even mentioning the stuff that other people have had to deal with, like dead pixels, the switch dock scratching the screen, and even the entire thing bending, which is, and let me be the first to say, uh, not great, but all of these issues are minor in the face of this one. If you own a Switch, you've almost definitely heard about this. You've probably even experienced it, because these sticks are, and let me put it lightly, fucking garbage. They work fine until, you know, you look at them funny, spend too much time spinning Luigi around in an elevator, god forbid you use them, you know, advanced operations. And then, just like that, they get a mind of their own, giving your favourite game character the ability to walk exclusively to the left. Or maybe the camera starts spinning because it just feels like it, I don't know. It's like magic, but if you spelt magic, like this. 
This issue has gotten so bad that Nintendo are actually getting sued over it by multiple different law firms. And, you know, at this point, I'd expect a decent company to hold up their hands and go, yeah, sorry fellas, we messed up, let's fix the problem so it doesn't happen again. But instead of that, they're claiming the issue isn't a real problem and hasn't caused anyone any inconvenience. Because of course they are. To give them credit, Nintendo has been repairing the issue free of charge since 2019, but that isn't an excuse. Microsoft repaired 360s for free, but that didn't make red rings any less of an issue. It's like putting a band-aid on a gunshot wound. The difference is that Microsoft quickly released a new version of their system that didn't break horribly, and Nintendo released a new version of their system that still breaks horribly. It's still not a solution, you've still got all of those broken machines in the world, but going out of your way to try and fix the problem is better than ignoring it and hoping it will go away. Or that it doesn't exist. It's just, Nintendo used to be so respected for their consistency and build quality. You knew when you bought a Nintendo system, you'd never even have to think about using that warranty. It was a joke how invincible their consoles were. And now, like for fuck's sake, they couldn't even make a fan cover correctly. When the Switch was first unveiled a few years ago, Nintendo also whipped out a freshly enhanced port of Mario Kart 8 with some new tweaks and battle mode additions, basically giving the Switch a Mario Kart game from the word go. This was pretty neat, all the people who had never seen a Mario Kart 8 before were basically getting a brand new game, and for the two people who unfortunately had, well, sounds like a you problem. It was a really smart move on Nintendo's part, siphon the best game from the Wii U and stick it on the inevitably more successful system and just watch the profits roll in. And boy did they. But then another thought popped into their heads. What if we do that? Again? Pokémon Tournament DX, Bayonetta 1 and 2, LEGO City Undercover, Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze with new funky mode, Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition, Captain Toad Treasure Tracker with bonus levels based on Super Mario Odyssey, New Super Mario Bros U Deluxe, Tokyo Mirage Sessions Sharp FE Encore, Pikmin 3 Deluxe, and Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury. You know, I'd complain about lack of originality, but they managed to come up with a lot of different ways of saying Deluxe. This is not a console library, this is a console library duct taped to another console library. I know the Wii U underperformed and no one remembers it and these games would otherwise be rotting away in a landfill somewhere, but do you really need to port all of them? Like was Pokémon Tournament really begging for a deluxe edition? And on top of that, charging full price? Really? Almost all of these are as expensive as they were when they launched years ago. Some of them are more expensive. Why would I buy Pikmin 3? on the Switch for 50 when I could get it on the Wii U for 20? That's a rhetorical question. Answering that would ruin my argument. But thankfully, we're reaching a point now where Nintendo is starting to run out of Wii U games to slap a deluxe in front of. So I guess they'll now have to start making new games. Alright, now you're just taking the piss. A 3DS game that was released when the Switch was already on the market for £10 more than the original price. Fucking excellent. What's next? WarioWare Gold Remastered with two extra micro games? How about A Link Between Worlds Deluxe Edition at a stunning 720p resolution? Maybe Happy Home Designer HD? Or if we're getting really bold, how about a £50 Wii port? At least, at least with Miitopia, I could understand the price tag a little teensy bit. The game is clearly remastered, has some new content, no one bought the 3DS original in the first place, and it's £40 instead of £50. But this, you're charging £50 for a Wii port in widescreen and HD? Fucking Dolphin can do that, and what's more, that one's in 4K! What's next, you're gonna port the Wii U port of Twilight Princess and charge £50 for it? Oh, fuck off! For some people, this is a non-issue, and I, I get that. Releasing old games on Switch gives new people a chance to play them, especially when basically no one got a chance to in the first place. I only discovered how good Tropical Freeze was from the Switch port, something I never would have if I was forced to play it on this fucking thing. But when half of your yearly release schedule is overpriced ports and remasters, I think you need to step back, take a minute, and just open a fucking virtual console for God's sake. It's my squash break right now, so I'll keep this one brief. 
I've never been into modding or fan games or anything like that. It was never something that interested me. I've done a little bit of emulation, that's about it. And as much as I appreciate all the work that various communities put into this sort of stuff, I'm a white bread sort of man myself. I like my Mario Brothers plane, thank you. I don't want any of this or this, definitely not this. However, when has my interest in a subject ever stopped me from getting very, very mad about it? AM2R, Pokemon Uranium, Breath of the NES, Mario Royale, like a billion trillion other games. All of these were hit with DMCA claims by Nintendo, because Five Nights at Yoshi's was hurting the sales of Mario Maker 2. You hear about it time and time again. A dedicated fan makes something cool with Nintendo's characters, Kotaku writes an article about it, two hours later it's found dead in an alley with a cease and desist beside it. And then people get mad at Kotaku? Like, there's a lot of reasons to get mad at Kotaku for, but this is not one of them. Nintendo are just hyper protective over their IP, and it makes sense. They've spent years making sure that Mario has the exact right number of hairs in his mustache, so letting a fan get away with adding two more is an absolute no-go. But then you look at a company like Valve, who are founded on the idea of modding existing games and engines, who encourage modding with the Steam Workshop, who willingly let fans use their IP to make their own games and sell them on their storefront for real money. Or Sega, who brought in the creators of Sonic fan games to make their own official Sonic game for realsies, just because they felt like it. Or even companies like Capcom or Microsoft, who still protect their IP, but aren't dicks about it. And then you look back at Nintendo, and they're shutting down a free fan remake of a Game Boy Metroid game that had been in development for years, just so they could charge £40 for their own a year later. They're so petty that they actually got the Game Awards to remove a nomination for AM2R for Best Fan Project. Like, you guys know that people notice these things, right? Last year, Nintendo banned a Melee tournament for using a mod to play online, which is pretty fucking important during a global pandemic where no one could be in the same room as each other. Nintendo were actually supporting the event before this? God knows how they thought they were going to play Melee without being in the same room as the other person. Paper cups and some string, maybe? Rock, paper, scissors over the Switch online app? Speaking of not understanding how the internet works, the Nintendo Partner Program. YouTube has always been a bit of a no man's land for copyright infringement. No one really knows what's legal and what isn't, but most of the time gaming companies are fine with you making your funny Twitch highlights or whatever because it's basically free advertising for their game. Most of the time. Introducing the Nintendo Partner Program, a fun new way for Nintendo to get 40% of your 60% of your ad revenue for doing... Uh, uh, what was it again? All oh, right, nothing. If you wanted to show gameplay from any of Nintendo's games, you had to sign away your soul. Otherwise, Nintendo are within their full legal right to take down your Let's Play of Mario Brothers, you dirty criminal. And this makes sense because uh, it's a Nintendo's game. They made it. So suck it, little Timmy. Your channel's shit anyway. <laughs> Go cry, you little bitch. This was not a good look, and thankfully Nintendo got rid of the program in 2018, giving creators free reign to upload whatever they feel like. Unless it's the Mario Kart Wii soundtrack, they absolutely hate it if you upload that. Nintendo's like my dog, calm, docile, pretty cute, until it hears a FUD outside. And that online so- Fuck you, you fucking prick. Fan games pose no threat to their business, neither do ROM hacks or emulation, and as much as it pains me to admit it, Neither do my videos. And yet they're so determined to take as much action as possible against anything that infringes on their trademarks. Like they're scared that if they don't shut down Splatoon Adventures, then Splatoon 3 will be a commercial failure. Literally only diehard fans care about this stuff. And it's that exact community that Nintendo is indirectly turning against them. But at the same time though, they just sued a guy named Gary Bowser for selling Switch hacks. So you know what? This whole legal thing is all right actually. Squash breaks over. This is possibly the single greatest summary of everything wrong with Nintendo in one product. And everything wrong with me is the fact that I bought it. When Nintendo announced 3D All-Stars last year, they were met with a generally positive reception, because... Well, honestly, Nintendo could announce they were putting your smelly sock on the Switch and people would be hyped. Gamers everywhere celebrated that they could now play Mario 64 and Mario Galaxy on the go, while your friend Steve, who smells a bit, celebrated that he could now play Mario Sunshine on the go. Graphical enhancements, up assets, and even a button to spin in Mario Galaxy. Jesus Christ, take my money now. And whoa, mama, out in just two weeks, that's a Fortnite. And you know how I feel about Fortnite. 
But in amongst this excitement, there was another group, commonly referred to as the people with actually functional brains, who noticed something odd about this Mario All-Stars game. It wasn't very good. The people with actually functional brains, or the PAFB for short, pointed out several things that would have likely netted the collection a 7 on IGN's patented 7 to 10 scale, that is if they didn't forget to give the collection a rating. Things like Mario 64 running in 4x3 at 720p, the ridiculous price tag, the complete lack of Mario Galaxy 2, the cover art that looks like an intern slapped it together in an afternoon, the lack of GameCube controller support for Sunshine even though the Switch already supported GameCube controllers and Smash Bros, the menu that looks like an intern slapped it together in an afternoon, the emulation in some of the games being broken in places, all the UI in Mario 64 looking like an intern slapped it together in an afternoon, and the insinuation that Mario Sunshine is actually good. The lack of effort just radiated from this release. Forget a celebration of Mario's legacy, this was free ROMs dumped on a Switch cart with some soundtracks added in for good measure. They could have done so much more with this. Forget adding Galaxy 2, how about a menu that emulated the original Mario All-Stars, maybe an art book that came with the physical copy, even a couple pages of Mario history? Anything could have improved this. But for all its faults, there was something far worse about this terrible collection than the fact they were selling it. The fact they were going to stop selling it. Nintendo, in their infinite wisdom, decided to sell 3D All-Stars for a limited time, both physically and digitally, from September 18th to March 31st. Now this does make sense in theory. Nintendo did a similar thing in the past with their other compilations. They only made a small number of copies, and then after that, well, get it on eBay, fucker. It's a collector's item. Not many people are gonna want Kirby's dream collection anyway. And hey, you get some cool shit with it too. Making it limited makes perfect sense. But then you look at 3D All-Stars, a collection of games not already available on the Switch, one of which hasn't ever been re-released, with barely any additional extras in sight, and yet it's still only available for a limited time. Why? Artificial FOMO. Nintendo has been using this tactic for a while, deliberately making less of something to drum up interest in said something. And hey, they're not alone. They did it with the Wii, they did it with the Switch, they probably tried it with the Wii U, but thankfully supply met demand in that case. It's a scummy move for sure, but making a reduced amount of consoles to make the consoles seem harder to come by is not the same as removing an eShop listing after an arbitrary deadline. There is no reason to do this. You're not losing any money from keeping the listing up. You're not gaining anything from taking it down. It's not like Nintendo is losing the license to Mario at the end of March. So that leaves us with two options. Either Nintendo are the dumbest company on the planet, and honestly, I'm not ruling that one out, or they're deliberately releasing a poorly made and overpriced product, and then using the idea of an artificial limited time offer to get people to buy it. Why do I like this company? I really loved Nintendo as a kid. I had all the games, I collected the magazine, I even got a couple things from Club Nintendo. I remember passionately defending the Wii U to one of my friends, because I respected their attempts to innovate in a space that was growing increasingly stagnant. Also, I was an idiot. And I still love that about the company, their willingness to try new things and experiment no matter if they fall flat on their face or succeed beyond their wildest expectations. Their games can be pure magic, whisking me away back to a time when I looked like this. But at the same time, I just wrote an 8 page script passionately complaining about them, filmed it, edited it, uploaded it, made a thumbnail, and now you're watching it with one hand and a bag of pom bears, yeah I see you. Nintendo aren't terrible, far from it, but they are infuriating. Because here's a company that has been dealt the best deck of cards possible, with some of the most valuable IP in the world, with a creative team comprised of the best in the business, and yet, Instead of cranking out modern masterpieces, they're failing to deliver a competent online service, releasing systems that break if you so much as look at them, falling back on their backlog in a desperate attempt to make even more money, disregarding their dedicated fans without a single thought, and releasing products that are rushed, unfinished, and manipulative. And they're making a fucking Pikmin mobile game.